Today we're going to talk about modern computer architecture. Although modern computers are still designed in accordance with the von Neumann architecture, a lot of complexity has evolved in computer implementation since 1947. One particular problem is that modern computers have evolved to have huge memories, as much as many gigabytes. Computer architectures still need to be backward compatible with their predecessor architectures, and that means there are usually not enough bits in an instruction word to address such large memories. Modern computer architectures combine the instruction address field with one or more other values to form an effective address. The effective address is what goes on the memory address bus, the address after computation. The concept of an effective address means memories much larger than implied by the number of address bits in the instruction can be used. The effective address for an instruction is the address that's actually used to refer to an operand. Often forming the effective address involves computation to get enough bits to address all of memory. Addressing modes for data access and for program flow control, that is branching, can be different. The simplest form of addressing is direct addressing. The address in the instruction points to an operand in main memory. This could require 32 or more bits in the instruction. In register addressing, the operand itself is held in a register. The instruction only needs enough bits to address all of the registers. So if we have 16 registers, we need 4 bits of address. If we have 128 registers, we still only need 7 bits of address. In base displacement addressing, the effective address is formed from bits of the instruction added to the contents of a base register. The base register must have enough bits to address all of memory, but the number of bits in the instruction can be much smaller. In register indirect addressing, the address of an operand in main memory is held in the register. Now, in register addressing, the operand itself was held in the register. In register indirect addressing, it's the address in main memory that is held in the register, and that address goes on the memory address bus. With memory indirect addressing, some method like base displacement addressing is used to locate an indirect memory location, and that indirect memory location contains the effective address. Memory indirect addressing is largely obsolescent, but some early computers had special locations at low memory addresses that could be used in this way. A few bits in the instruction could address one of those low memory addresses, and it in turn contained the effective address. Memory indirect addressing is expensive in that it requires two memory accesses. Indexed addressing and index value and this, we use this when we want to do something like step through an array. If I have an array of 64-bit words, um, 64 bits is 16 bytes, right? Is that right? Good. I should never try to do arithmetic while I'm standing up in front of a class because it doesn't work. Um, my brain will do only one thing at a time. Um, so if I'm stepping through an array that is 16 bytes wide, I can add um, 16, 16, 16, 16, and step through the address by increasing an index register. And that, that's the way we loop through an array, for example. Um, there are other addressing modes that we apply before indexing. So we could have a register indirect indexed so that we have two registers, the register holding the address and the register holding the index involved in the address arithmetic. Immediate addressing, this is one that I had a hard time understanding this until somebody explained it to me in words of one syllable. There is no address. The data go right there in the instruction word and that's what makes it immediate. Everything is already there. I don't need to go to memory. So if I needed, for example, a small constant like a 2, I can put that in the address field of an instruction 
And I got my two right there without ever hitting memory. Um, or here's another one, add immediate 127. I need um, seven bits to be able to do that, seven bits of address. In TBC, we've got eight bits, so I could do that. TBC doesn't have an add immediate, but never mind about that now. Okay, so we have an operation code and an address field, but the address field actually holds the value rather than holding the address of a value. For flow control, the basic operation of the von Neumann architecture is sequence, one thing after another. Program counter holds the address of the next instruction, and we go through them one, two, three, four in order, in sequence. In direct addressing, like branch to somewhere, um, the full memory address is in the address field. In relative addressing, the bits of the address field get added to something else, like a register, to um, to form the effective address of the branch target. Okay. Register indirect addressing. Um, the branch address is held in a register. I only need enough bits in the instruction to enumerate the number of registers. Stack indirect addressing. You saw that in the call and return example. I don't need any address bits in the instruction because the implicit address is that value that's at the top of the stack. Memory indirect addressing, um, I fetch a branch address from memory and then branch to there. And that that is horribly inefficient because I have a memory access in there. But you will see when we start talking about handling interrupts that there is this thing called a branch table or a jump table that that becomes very useful. So suppose I have seven devices with seven different interrupt handlers, and we haven't talked about interrupts yet, but I can have seven addresses in memory and jump into that array with a device number. A nanosecond is this long. Um, I think my former student may have her hands a little bit far apart, but maybe not very much. Um, just under 12 inches, okay? So we want to improve performance. We can crank up the clock speed. But remember, a nanosecond is this long, and we have to worry about gate delay. There is a point beyond which I cannot crank up the clock speed because the signal won't get through all of that combinational logic in time. And worse, the faster I run the clock, the more power gets dissipated by the CPU, and when I dissipate power, it turns into heat. And when it turns into heat enough, it's liable to let all the smoke out of your CPU. So we can run, we can do cl faster clock speeds, but within the present technology, the four or five gigahertz speed where you find things right now is about it. Um, for the reasons that we discussed when we went through all of this stuff with combinational logic. Faster buses and faster circuits. Um, the PCI Express with up to 32, I think, lanes, each of which transmits data very rapidly. Um, wider instruction and data paths, so 64 bits instead of 32. More memory and faster memory, although I told you earlier, memory speed increases are not keeping up with CPU speed increases. CPU is getting faster, faster than the memory is getting faster, if that came out in English. And faster disks. Um, these days, it's not easy to buy a laptop that does not have a solid state disk in it. And just before that, machines with, that needed the huge disks we're spinning the disks at 15,000 RPM, so around really fast. Okay, the earliest computers were 
about as simple as the tiny binary computer that we're using as an example in this course. Moore's Law, remember I can double the number of devices on a chip roughly every two years, and the cost of the chip is roughly proportional to the area. Not the number of devices, but the area. So if the number of, of if the density doubles, then for the same price, I get a chip that's twice as powerful. And that is what let us go from chips with a few thousand transistors to chips with a couple of billion transistors and introduce the complexity that gets us the extra speed. Hardware designers look at high-level languages and said, you know, if we had hardware instruction that would do what that high-level language would do, our programs would run faster. That turned out not to be the case, but it kind of seems like it makes sense. And so by the middle 1970s, arithmetic logic units and control units were hideously complicated. And it didn't get any better after the 70s either, let me tell you that. Um, but there was, um, and we're about to talk about it, this movement toward the so-called reduced instruction set computer. So those complex instructions, the things that high-level languages do, generally got implemented as some, whoops, sorry, some number of simpler instructions. So people started analyzing running programs and what they found out is that very few of those complicated instructions were used. Now, remember compilers come from compiler writers who are people and the compiler writer memorizes, uh, no he doesn't, or she, um, the compiler writer ought to know all of the instructions that are available, but really knows only the most frequently used ones. And so those continue to be the most frequently used ones. Oops. A whole lot of time moving data back and forth between registers and memory. If I've only got 16 registers, um, I'm doing a load, store, load, store, load, store all the time. And a number of people in different places came to this conclusion at about the same time. Get rid of those hideously complex instructions that are not being used very much anyway. And now all the transistors that I needed to make those instructions work can be used to make more registers, to put more memory on the CPU chip. All right, that idea started in the late 1980s with people like Professor David Patterson at UCLA. They said, we don't need all of these complex instructions because nobody's using them anyway. Let's do limited and simple instructions, fixed length, fixed format, and now I can build a computer that will execute those few instructions much, much faster because now I can use the extra transistors that Moore's Law gave me to speed up my few simple instructions. So a few kinds of instructions, not very many instruction formats, all the instructions are the same length. Um, and that was a big deal in 1988 or 89. The IBM mainframe had, I think, four different instruction lengths. And remember, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. The instruction had to be decoded before the program counter could be updated because until it was decoded, you didn't know how long it was. All operation codes the same length. High-level language statements generally do require several of these risk instructions, but the emphasis is on speed. Andrew Tannenbaum, who has written the book that we used to use and maybe still do to teach computer architecture in the computer science department. Tannenbaum said a CPU designer will sacrifice 
almost anything to complete one instruction every clock cycle. So here is the complete set of the Spark RISC instruction formats. There are five of them, and that's all there are, and they're all the same length. What are the features? Limited addressing modes. Um, remember I was talking about register index to address something instructions? If I only have two or three addressing modes, I don't need the complicated address computation hardware. Register-oriented instruction set. My instructions are going to operate only on registers. That's actually called a load store instruction set. Um, because the only memory accesses are loading registers or storing the register contents into memory. But if I have a bunch of registers, like 128 of them instead of 16, I can reduce the amount of data that shuffles back and forth between registers and memory multiple times. Okay, so changing signals just a minute, let me talk about the logical equivalence of hardware and software. With the caveat that there's got to be some hardware, hardware and software are logically equivalent. And if you think about it, um, microwave ovens are controlled with software these days. But back when I was a young man, they had springs and switches and timers. The hardware and the software, I, well, I used to be a young man. Um, it was many, many years ago, <laughs> but it is true. Um, and back in those days, hardware, switches, springs, buttons, switches. Um, and then someone built the hardware, uh, the software that did the same thing. Now, I still have to have the actuators, right? the thing that'll turn that magnetron on and that kind of stuff. But hardware and software are logically equivalent. So computer designers can implement a feature, whatever that feature might be, either in hardware or in software. They've got a choice, got, got a decision to make. Now, we kind of hummed the tiny binary computer's control unit. And, and we're going to get a closer look at it in just a second. In a microprogrammed control unit, um, there are programs stored in read-only memory that replace hardwired CPU instructions. Much more flexible, you can update the read-only memory, right? If there's a mistake in executing instructions, you can fix it. Um, easier to implement complex instructions I can emulate other CPUs. Um, you could, in the 90s, buy from IBM something they called a 9370 computer. It was a baby mainframe. Well, guess what? Deep inside of there is a power PC chip and some read-only memory that emulated the large IBM mainframes. However, a microprogram control unit usually requires more clock cycles. Now, do not let your brain slam shut. You don't have to know this. You don't even have to read it if you don't want to. But the column, the second from the left column that says location is an address in read-only memory. Um, the first block up there shows the microcode for an add instruction. And the second one shows the, micro, the microcode for a branch on positive. The add instruction, um, three, four, five, six, I think, if I counted right, six data path cycles to do that add instruction. Branch on positive only needs four data path cycles, and three of them are the fetch and decode part that we can't get rid of. The dots are bits that are set in that read-only memory. And a blank in a square says that bit is not set. So if I could do that for each of the TBC's instructions, 
and program those bits into read-only memory, I'd have a control unit made out of a hunk of read-only memory and very little else, just the things I needed to interface to that read-only memory. In hardware, I told you when we were talking about TBC that there were some number of, of inputs to the control unit, and I think I said there were 28 bits of output to the control unit. I could clearly do the same thing with combinational logic that I just showed you with read-only memory, okay? In that case, all that stuff is done with logic gates. It's faster, um, and RISC computers typically use hardware control units, not microprogrammed control units. All right, so when Patterson, Hennessy, and the rest of that crew were inventing the RISC reduced instruction set computer, they had to have a name for the enemy. And the name for the enemy that they come up with was the complex instruction set computer. Now, before, before Patterson, Hennessy, and the rest of them, they were just called computers. Different kinds of instructions, a bunch of them. Um, different instruction formats. Different instruction lengths. Different operation code lengths. You have to decode the first part of the operation code to know whether there is, even is a second part. Um, and things that we do in high-level languages can often be performed with one instruction. The trouble is that one instruction is likely to take several data path cycles or several clock cycles. The emphasis in the complex instruction computer was on flexibility. So this is the Intel 64 and 32-bit architecture instruction. No, you don't have to know anything about that except look at that diagram and say, holy smoke, that's complicated. Um, look at the number of places where it says one byte if required. And we don't know whether it's required until we've decoded the operation code, which is itself one, two, three bytes. Oops. Building a control unit for that will make your hair hurt. Okay. Um, the Intel architecture is complex um, instruction set architecture. So is the IBM Z series mainframe um, and a number of older CPUs. Not very many general purpose registers. Risk, risk computers tend to have 64 or 128 general purpose registers. Uh, IBM mainframe, 16 of them. A whole bunch of addressing modes. A large number of instructions, highly specialized. And instructions are varying sizes, which makes the control unit more complicated. Limitations, some instructions don't get used very frequently. Only a few are used all the time. Memory references are slow. They're slow with a, with a risk computer too, but we're gonna do fewer of them because we have a whole bunch of registers. I can get everything I need in 128 registers and then do a whole lot of work before I have to store them back to memory. But I've only got 16 registers. I'm constantly shuffling data back and forth. Procedure and function calls are a bottleneck. Okay, so in a complex instruction set computer, we might, in some number of clock cycles, do a three-step instruction and then a two-step instruction. And in, that, in the same time of, as that three-step instruction, three-cycle instruction, I might complete three complete instructions on a RISC computer. So performance, risk, simpler instructions. So I need more of them. My programs are gonna be bigger in the sense of, of how much memory I need. Um, but with complex instruction sets, more memory access for data, more bus traffic, more cache misses. If I had more registers, I could improve my complex instruction set performance, but when the first complex instruction set computers were designed, there was no room for more registers. 
That didn't happen until Moore's Law operated for a pretty large number of years. Now, what's going on right now is that those architectures that diverged went two different ways in the late 1980s and the 1990s are beginning to come back together because I can fit a lot more transistors on the same size chip now than I could in 1990. So converging because of greater chip densities and we, we kind of hit a speed limit in that around four gigahertz range and chip designers are now making multi-core chips with more than one CPU on the same piece of silicon. So when you talk about an eight core chip, you're really talking about eight CPUs in one package. Now, in theory, eight CPUs in one package have the same processing power as one CPU that goes eight times as fast. In practice, that's not true because we have to consider the partitionability of problems. If I have a problem that I can break into eight pieces and run it one piece on each of those eight CPU cores, that's, I'm in Fast City there. If I have a problem where each step depends on the previous step, having eight cores doesn't do me any good. Um, Oh, blast. I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote the Mythical Man Month. At any rate, this guy whose name I can't remember gave as an example, bearing a baby takes nine months no matter how many women you assign. You cannot speed that process up. Um, so having eight women in charge of, of making the baby does not make it go any faster than just having one. Um, the author is Fred Brooks. I finally got that out of my, out of the slowing down with old age neurons. Okay, so cluster computing. If you were able to visit the Google data center out in Lithia Springs, out past Six Flags, which you can't, there are guys with guns saying, no, no, go away. Um, what you would find is thousands of commodity size scale computers, pizza box size, one and, a, uh, one and a quarter rack units or something like that, and um, 80 of them in a rack and hundreds of racks. All right, this is, this is one of a dozen or so Google data centers in the United States. Um, the Big Mac at Virginia Tech, now, now obsolete, but also worked that way. If I have a problem that is divisible, and a lot of problems are. Google is the, is the poster child of divisible problems because there are thousands of users. Each one can have their stuff run on one of those computers, and that works. If there's only one user, it doesn't work to have thousands of computers anymore. And then there are parallel computing. Um, if anybody pays attention to the stock market, um, the market value of the NVIDIA Corporation, the makers of graphics cards, just hit two T trillion dollars because the same parallel computation that can be used to generate computer graphics can be used to operate artificial intelligence. And you probably can't buy an NVIDIA graphics card anymore at all, anywhere because all of those chips are being put into AI machines. Um, and there are other experimental architectures. Okay, so modern computers, separate fetch and execute units. So I can be fetching the next instruction while I'm executing the current one. TBC uses that one data path for fetching, decoding, and executing. But if I could separate that, I could do fetch the next one while I'm decoding this one. Pipelining, which we'll talk about in a minute. Scalar and vector processing. Scalar processing is working on one data item at a time. Vector processing, the thing that those NVIDIA cards do, is the big deal in artificial intelligence. Um, 
Has any any one of you noticed that artificial intelligence, the chat GPT, gives you wrong answers? Yeah, it does. Um, so don't do it. It'll get you. Okay. Um, superscalar processing. I'll have, we've got a diagram coming up, and I'll show you what that's about. Separate fetch and execute units does exactly what I just said. The fetch unit gets the instruction, figures out what the opcode is going to be, and then passes it on to an execute unit. Um, and we have an instruction pointer register that helps us keep track of what's going on from all of these separate, separately fetched instructions. That's not the same as the program counter. The program counter still holds the address of the next instruction. The execute unit gets the decoded instruction. So instead of getting a four or eight or something bit opcode, it gets all the bits that are necessary to execute the instruction and executes it. So here is, here's a diagram of that, which you don't need to worry about very much. But notice that there's an addressing unit that does the address computation, a bus interface up at the top right, and then the instruction fetch unit. I can be fetching one instruction while I'm decoding the previous one. And finally, I have an execute unit, which has an arithmetic logic unit and some registers. OK, if you were to. Uh, go to a Ford factory, you would find out that it takes somewhere between a day and a day and a half, 24 to 36 hours, to build a modern car. And yet, cars come off of the assembly lines at 50 to 100 an hour. And the, the secret to that is the assembly line, okay? If I have an assembly line that's 30 hours long, and I'm... I'm Mixing time and distance again, just like a nanosecond is this long, okay? If I have an assembly line that's 30 hours long, and I start production of a car every 60 seconds, after 30 hours, I am finishing a car every 60 seconds. Once the pipeline is full, I'm finishing a car every 60 seconds, um, including the Model A Fords there. Instruction pipelining in computers is the same idea. We're going to overlap, fetch, decode, and execute of sequences of instructions. I'm going to have a bunch of them in process at the same time. Only one instruction is being completed. There's, just like there's only one car being completed in any minute out of that pipeline. But I've got a lot of them in process. In scalar processing, the average execution time is about equal to the clock speed. So I can finish a clock, I'm sorry, I can finish an instruction about every clock cycle. Now, there are some problems. One of them is that different instructions might have different numbers of steps, different numbers of data path cycles. And we run into problems with data latency if instruction B needs the result from instruction A, well, B can't do anything till A finishes. And we have to stall the pipeline until the data are available. There's also a problem from branching. Um, I, could, I could get ahead of myself, to, so to speak, and finish some instructions that are not needed because one of the instructions is a branch and I don't know whether it's, been, it's going to be taken or not until it gets executed. So what do I do about that branch that I don't know whether it's going to be taken? Well, I could have two pipelines and take the branch in one, not take it in the other one, and then decide once I know whether the branch is going to be taken, decide which one to keep. Um, I could guess. And that's not as as crazy as it sounds, if I think about computer programming in general, I can guess that a backward loop will always be taken. That's not true, but it's pretty close to true because the backward branch, 
I, I said loop a minute ago. I should have said backward branch. The backward branch is the bottom of a loop. And it's going to be taken for every time through that loop except the last one. So if I guess that that backward branch will always be taken, I'm going to be right 99 out of 100 times, maybe. Um, I can require an instruction following a branch not be dependent on the branch. If I can find some useful work to do, I can put it in after the branch. Um, I can do instruction reordering. This is another one that will make your hair hurt. Um, we have now enough transistors on that little fingernail sized piece of silicon that is the CPU chip to try executing a stream of instructions in different orders and then pick the one that's right when we know which one to pick. You don't have to worry about that at all except to recognize that instruction reordering is a way of dealing with the branch problem of pipelining. So here's an example. We start instruction one, and one clock cycle later, we start instruction two, and one clock cycle later, we start three, and then we start four. And pretty soon, we're finishing an instruction every clock cycle, even though those instructions take more than one step. Just like finishing a car every 60 seconds, even though that car has been in the assembly line for 30 hours. Superscalar processing is processing more than one instruction per clock cycle. I have, I, dis, I separate the fetch and the execute part as much as I can, and I have more than one um, execute unit. So I have buffers between fetch and decode, and there I am, more than one execute unit, and I'll show you that in a diagram. Um, once again, you don't need to worry about this very much, but if you look um, kind of in the middle, there is an instruction unit and a branch processing unit, and then on the left half of that row next to the bottom, um, there are the general purpose registers and an integer processing unit on the left, load store in the middle, floating point registers, and floating point processing on the right. So if I had exactly one integer instruction, one load store instruction, and one floating point instruction, I could complete them all at the same time because I've got three different functional units there. If you have billions of transistors, you can do stuff like that. All right. Um, this, this basically just says with superscalar processing, I am completing more than one instruction per clock cycle. Okay. Um, if we're completing more than one instruction per clock cycle, we're, we could execute instructions out of order. Um, the dependencies among instructions are called hazards. They're data hazards and branch hazards. Um, data hazard being the data is not ready yet because an instruction that needs it uh, and the instruction that generates it hasn't finished yet. Um, we talked about branch dependencies. We can do this thing called speculative execution. Um, guess whether the branch will be taken or not. Execute assuming one or the other, and then back up and start over if we guessed wrong. Um, we can try to do branch prediction. We can keep a branch history table. I've got lots of transistors now. I have billions of them. And I can do things like keep a branch history table for each branch instruction in the program and guess that it's going to do the same thing on this instruction that it did on the last one. I can do register renaming. If I need to store something in register one, but register one is still waiting for a result of a previous calculation, my calculation's done, I can store it someplace else. And when the time comes, rename the registers. The registers, remember, 
our, our index basically from register 0 to register 127. All I need is a table that says what used to be register 1 is now there at register 18. Okay, a couple of definitions you do need these. Multi-programming, two or more programs running concurrently on one computer. Multi-processing, a computer has two or more processors. Okay, for multi-processing, our motivation is we want faster computing, more processing, and the ability to do things in parallel. We talked about parallelism, and I gave you the Fred Brooks example of making a baby. That one is not parallelizable. Brooks also said, digging a ditch is pretty parallelizable. You put a bunch of guys out there with shovels and the ditch will get done faster. Um, and it, so it depends on the nature of the program that you're, of the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, I can couple processors in a multiprocessor configuration either tightly or loosely. Um, in a tightly coupled system, all the memory in the input and output are shared. And that's basically what we have in the PC class computer these days. Um, you might have four or eight cores, but only one main memory and only one set of input and output. Um, I can configure either master-slave processing, which nobody does anymore, um, because that master processor, the one that's assigning work to the others, becomes a bottleneck. Or I can do symmetric multiprocessing, where every processor runs an algorithm to see what it will do next. So here's a picture of a tightly coupled system. Uh, I've got three CPUs, each with its own on-chip cache, an L2 cache between the system bus and memory, um, host PCI bridge, and then all of the I.O. stuff. In symmetric multiprocessing, each CPU or each core has access to all of the resources, and each CPU runs an algorithm to determine what work to do next. Very reliable can be made fault tolerant. That is, I can say if a CPU fails, um, some other CPU is keeping track of the work, and we will take the work from that failed CPU and just send it someplace else. And we can balance the workload across CPUs. Disadvantages, while well, I can have resource conflicts, if two CPUs both want to access memory and there's only one memory bus, one of them is going to have to wait. It's also complicated to implement symmetric multiprocessing, but the advantages outweigh the complexity, and so modern computers are basically all SMP, symmetric multiprocessing. In a loosely coupled system, this is clusters of or multi-computer systems. Each system's got its own CPU, its own memory, and its own I.O. Um, those are very fault tolerant, very scalable. This is how Google, Amazon, um, and a bunch of others get the computing power that they need. Two ways, shared nothing and shared disk model. Um, Google uses a shared nothing model. Um, in the shared nothing model, we connect nodes with high speed network links, like high speed ethernet, and we partition work um, through division of data and message passing. Not much communication between nodes, um, but we can end up with an inefficient division of work. So here's the picture of the shared nothing model. Um, each CPU and memory has its own, each CP, blast, each CPU has its own memory and its own disk, and there is a message link that connects all of that stuff together. In the shared disk model, it looks the same, except we have this thing called an I.O. director that can access the shared disk using message passing from any of the CPUs. I can get lots of computing power if I have a perfectly partitionable problem. A problem that I can divide into as many as many pieces as I need. Um, scalable, just shove a few more computers in there. 
um, cheaper than a single large computer, less expensive. Fault tolerant, um, the, um, I did get to, to visit the Google Data Center, although they would not let me back where the computers were. And um, the people who work there mostly spend their time rebooting computers or replacing computers. Um, when one of them stops working, well, it just stopped working. And there is a message on a control display, and eventually someone will go reboot it, and no one will notice that it stopped and then restarted. Highly available, um, load balancing either through software or by geographically distributing. And I think I mentioned that Google has about 12 data centers in the United States. I'm not sure how accurate that 12 number is because as computers have gotten more powerful, Google has been able to reduce the number of data centers they need. So the number got gone on up there into into two, solidly into two digits and is now coming back down. Okay, the Beowulf cluster, and this was invented, I think, at NASA in the 1990s, so a long time ago. Um, there's a Beowulf cluster that was started at Washington University in St. Louis, turned on for the first time in 2005. They're still using it, still running. Um, very simple, very configurable, very low cost, loosely coupled, um, and we connect the computers with an Ethernet. Now back before distance learning, this class used to build a Beowulf cluster as, as an exercise. Can't do that anymore because I don't have a way to offer that to the distance students. Okay, external, there's a, a computer that serves as a gateway. Okay, um, basically a Beowulf cluster is a bunch of computers running Linux and then running some specialized software that makes them appear to be a cluster. All commercial off-the-shelf components and often configured with this thing called a blade computer. And there's a picture of that coming up. That's a whole entire computer with two disk drives on a single printed circuit card. Power supply is not there, it's, it is separate. And one can plug a bunch of those into a blade enclosure and get something that holds 16 or 32 or 64 computers in a, an enclosure that's not much bigger than a bread box. And then there are the massively parallel architectures. These are the so-called supercomputers. Um, clusters of really big machines or really big Beowulf computers. Once again, it has to be, has, the problems have to be partitionable to get the, get the real deal out of that. Cloud computing, this you can get from Amazon these days, for example. Supercomputer performance through distributed CPUs and self-provisioning. That is, you can add CPUs to your piece of the, of the Amazon cloud as you need them. Amazon will charge you for it, but you don't have to ask them. You just, just add your piece. Okay. A cluster, even though it's all the pieces are connected with a network, appears externally as a single computing unit. Network nodes, like the machines in this room, they're individually um, identifiable. The workload on a cluster is determined by load balancing software, shifts the workload around. Um, network workload depends on who's doing what. Uh, I don't think any of you is using the machines in this room today, and that's good. And even I'm not, I brought my own laptop. Massively parallel architectures, hundreds to millions of CPUs, or these days GPUs, graphics processing units. Um, each one of them has a, some amount of local memory, not very much. Then there's a large shared memory. Uh, and 
each CPU can calculate a part of a problem independently. We've got good weather modeling software, finally, that um, can take advantage of these massively parallel computers. <laughs> okay, we covered a lot of stuff today, but we're caught up. And we've actually got a couple of minutes left. We've got three, I think. Who has questions? Okay, this is all recorded, I hope, so that those of you who want to hear me forget Fred Brooks's name again can go do that. Um, the nouns are, are the second thing to go. I forget what the first one is. If there are no questions, thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, and I'll see you on Thursday.